Coming to you from the loading ready run orbiting underground moon base, it's the Lurcast. Ooh. Ooh, yes, I've not heard or said that in quite some time. This is the Lurcast, the Loading Ready Run podcast, Back from the Dead, 20th anniversary edition. Hello, I'm Graham. And I'm Paul. And, and uh, we had nothing to say until now. Yeah. That's why we stopped the, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't actually know. I, th- I think it was, I think it was that we wrapped up the Lurcast originally because it was like, yeah, we're just. We're, we're just doing Q&A of the same questions over and over again. It, it was mostly Q&A by the end, wasn't and it? And the Q&A thread is like. Oh, I forgot about that. Five pages long. Oh boy! When we're on like the third page, yeah. we'll definitely talk about the forums at some point in this podcast. What is this podcast? This is a limited run, uh, so we already have a defined end it's a video podcast series. Um, with there's going to be a lot of video stuff. So if you're if you're not watching, definitely you know check it out if you have the interest to do so. Of the history of Loading Ready Run, because it is our 20th anniversary, which is definitely something I never thought I was going to say. Um, I mean, I never really thought about it. No, me neither. My 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 dad has, for years now, stopped asking me if we have a plan. So, you know. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was only for like the first, you know, like five or six years, I think. Mm. You know, it's like, well, what, what, where are you going with this? What are you doing? What's what's the plan here? And I was like, <laughs> are you supposed to have a plan? Yeah, don't, don't have a plan now. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to talk through sort of the the history of um, of the the whole the whole thing. Some of it will be sort of chronological. Broadly speaking, let me let me give you a preamble of what to expect. This is uh, this is James's brainchild, actually. This season, yeah, on this the 20th anniversary <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, intercut a bunch of things. exactly. Yeah. So this episode, episode one, is just myself and Paul talking about everything leading up to. When we started loading ready run in 2003. Yeah. 2003. Yeah. Yeah. Then every episode after that is going to be two years of time. So the first two years and the next two years. Those episodes will start with a segment very much like this with myself and Paul having a chat and our recollections. And then there'll be a part two for each of those episodes in the same episode, but there'll be a second segment where we have other folks sit down with us and also talk about their thoughts. So for example, the first episode will be the two people who've been around the crew the longest who are not myself and Paul, James and Kathleen. And then it'll be a different folks every subsequent episode. And we'll, we'll try to, I mean, the timelines don't necessarily line up perfectly. No, not but we'll, exactly. We'll try to get sort of the people who uh, joined us yeah. in that year, yeah. in that section, or, or people who have particularly relevant stuff to talk about in that section. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I want to make this real clear because I know it's going to bug someone, but not necessarily everything that we talk about is going to be presented exactly in chronological order, such as, for example, there will be one episode in the future where we just talk about like every podcast. Mm. So like we're not going to dive deep onto like each individual podcast in the timeline of the two years of where it would be in those episodes because the point is we have a plan. <laughs> so if we miss something, feel free to leave a comment about it. But I, I, I'm i betting you that we actually have a plan for it. Like Battlestar Galactica, you know? They have a plan. Yeah, right. <laughs> Although, did they? I don't did know. Did they have a plan? Is it, Do we have like a Battlestar Galactica plan or like a lost plan? Uh, somewhere in between. Okay, good. <laughs> So yeah, this this episode is just uh, who are we and what? How did we meet and what did we do together and what led to the beginning of of Loading Ready Run? Mm. Um, I mean, we were both we were both born here, which yep. is which I've discovered is unusual. When I was going through uh, the chemo, um, one of the more on that in a later episode. One of the um, sort of pat go-to small talk responses or queries rather that medical techs tend to use is, so how long have you lived in Victoria? Mm. You know, like while they're waiting for the IV to populate or whatever, you know, they're like, so how long have you lived here? And I'm like, I I was born here. And every time they're like, oh, this is, this is unusual. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess 
people leave? People or more people have come? I'm not entirely sure what the what the what the ratio is. People like are born here, leave, and then come back. Mm. Right. Like they go and live somewhere else, and they're like, eh, "Actually, I kind of want to go back." Mm -hmm. But I don't. When we were growing up, it was the 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 sort of the like hilarious, um, jokey motto, I suppose, for Victoria was the home of the newlywed and the nearly dead. Mm. And I don't think that's as true anymore. No, no. A lot of newlyweds probably can't afford to live here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the uh, doctors <laughs> yeah. is, is one of the, we have like, I think we have one of the highest per capita of doctors mm. just because they like to and, live here. And they're keeping the nearly dead alive for too long. <laughs> <laughs> so the I middle say, class yeah. can't move back. We have high per capita of specialty doctors, mm. not GPs, which is actually what we need. Yeah. But anyway, so we met uh, in uh, in school. Yeah. Um, grade. Uh, it was a there was a grade five six split class. Four five. Uh, four, four five. five sorry. Yeah. yeah. Four five split class. Is split are split classes common in most places? They're very common here. And are they still common? I don't, there's, yeah, there's some at Penelope school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a class size thing where it's like, we don't have enough people for a. Uh, and so, yeah, the teacher would like teach, be like, here's some math. Do, 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 do. And then you go over to the other side, like, well, this side works on it. Here's some harder math. Yeah. Which sounds side. like it's gotta be hell for the teachers. Also, we had, a, we had split teachers. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. Yeah. We had like three days a week. It was like Mrs. Weber. I don't know why I remember these mm. names. Mrs. It was Mrs. Weber and Mrs. Keys, and we had Mrs. Weber. I want to say three or four days a week, and then Mrs. Keys for the the other two or one day. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, and so, but but a lot of the stuff, you know, was I. I'm a year older than Graham, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of the stuff they did sort of combine things, and so we ended up doing various projects and stuff together. Yeah, um, and you know, hanging out at recess and stuff, and you know. I don't know actually what your school experience was like prior to that class, but it was not great for me. I'll level with you. It wasn't great after that class either. <laughs> um, elementary school was uh, not like my greatest time. Uh, mm. Definitely as kind of a dorky, unconfident, socially awkward um, goober. Yeah. Uh, Nerds got, weren't really cool back then. No, no, I'm, I'm through. I've seen some people <laughs> in, in the same sort of way of like, I, I had to suffer. Why, why can you not suffer? Uh, I've definitely seen some people annoyed that like, it's okay to like things like video games and stuff now, but yeah. definitely I'm all for it. But, uh, yeah, back then it was, uh, you know, I was like, I liked, uh, Star Trek. I watched Star Trek with my mom. And uh, that didn't go over well. And everyone played video games. I don't know why that was a thing. But yeah, all through kindergarten and grade one, two, and three, I had like a friend, mm. nice guy, and he moved away. And uh, so then starting in this class, I had no friends. Luckily, <laughs> Paul yeah. was there. I don't even remember like how we particularly met. I don't know either. Now you, that was you, that was your first year in from the French immersion program, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. For the first four years of elementary school, uh, I was in a French immersion program, which didn't like go super well. Mm. They still offer that at some, some um, places. But... It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of a cool idea. Mm. Um, and uh, had the weird, had the weird side effect that like certain school specific vocabulary, I never learned the English version of. So like a right. workbook, I would always call a cahier. Right. Because that's just how I learned that. And, and you know, Francophone version of the nat national anthem and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. For those unaware, which is probably the majority of people listening, though you can, I, you likely you can infer it from, from the language. Uh, a French immersion program is the teachers just talk, talk at you in French mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole time. The, the idea is that you learn your school stuff and French at the same time rather than doing like a French class. But um, there's ups and downs on it. Yeah, it, it was, I think, I, I don't think it was, it was, I sort of, I think I sort of got like an ear for French. Mm. I certainly don't actually like know any French, but no. I, uh, 
I can, you know, recognize it being spoken and that kind of stuff. There's, it's, it's this hilarious thing that I've, I've talked about this before, of course, which is that Canada's official second language is French. And in school, you can do French immersion or you, or if you don't do French immersion, then you have to take French classes. Mm. Uh, but all of that and the official second language of Canada is France French, which people in Canada don't speak. <laughs> But like in Quebec, they speak Quebecois, which is a dialect of French, and yeah, is there's some some wo some words that are just completely different, and so it's just kind of funny that it's like, don't worry, we're because we speak we speak French in this country, so we're going to prepare you for that by not teaching you that dialect. <laughs> we learned the recorder that year. Yeah, that was yeah. when they gave us the recorders. Mm. So grade six, I left. Yeah, that was one year. Yeah. We were we, we only got that one year at the same school. So then, yeah, grade six, I switched to a different school, uh, St. Michael's University School. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, my brother had gone, was, was going there, and uh, it's a school set up. It has, like, uh, borders, like uh, 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 international students. Mm. And the big thing is that because there's international students, whenever there's a – whenever there's a uh, – three-day weekend mm -hmm. it they do a four-day weekend because international students need more travel time oh right so my brother got more holidays than i did ah. which i did not like <laughs> he got more days off school yeah uh. well he, but, but he, also also you 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 it was like from eight instead of from nine in the morning like like they it the, was the, longer per day the hours worked out okay. the same but, but you anyway. had to wear a uniform and go to chapel yeah yeah they're very they they soft pedaled the fact that it was technically like an Anglican school. Yeah. But uh I never actually I never asked you much about that. Like you had to go there. it was weekly or every day or what? Uh, no, weekly. Healthy? Weekly. I think Tuesday. But it was like they were like pretty like, yeah, you gotta go to chapel, but Yeah, know, but a know. lot of but a lot of people didn't and also there were a lot of students that weren't were Christian. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a lot of Jewish students and a lot of international students who are whatever you know they, yeah. they and so they couldn't really like be sticklers for it uh so yeah they, <laughs> they're much more interested in getting the money from I, the international I, students than they are for spreading the word of god <laughs> uh i used to usually go anyway to to, to chapel just because mm -hmm. i found it but it was hilarious on the occasions where there was like something a big event that was going on mm -hmm. and they actually they were like every doing it in the chapel and it was very clear that the chapel could not fit all the people in the school <laughs> <laughs> but you only notice sometimes because generally most people or a bunch of people didn't did, just didn't show up yeah yeah that's really funny yeah there were not enough pews in the chapel for everybody in the school <laughs> so I, I was at the it's a private school and i was there f right through till grade 12. Mm -hmm. um but grim and i still we stayed in touch stayed, stayed in touch which we, was we nice hung out yeah yeah we hung out on on you know weekends and holidays and all that it, stuff it was because this is, of course, you know, back when you had to memorize phone numbers, mm -hmm. and it was like my my uh, my parents, obviously, like my my home, uh, their store, they ran a retail store, and your phone number were like the ones that I remembered. Yeah, because uh, it was Probably like uh, the phone numbers that I can still remember now. Yeah, so and even I think, though your parents don't live at that place anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think some of them are still active, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna impress everybody by rattling off. If I could just make stuff up, you can, you don't know. Um, yeah, we would we would still like keep in touch and and hang out sometimes. So this was still very much like I mean I'd be in grade five, right? So it was still like, mom, can you call Paul's mom and arrange a play date? Like it was not like, right. you know, not quite yet, sort of um, independent. But we would, uh, you know, we would even sort of do some amount of creative stuff at that point. I remember you showing me one of your stories with a comic hmm. of uh, the alien, right? Yeah, yeah. There was a, it was an alien. I, I see. I remember it because I plagiarized it. Ooh. For I think I, I think I told you this at the time, but it was because you had it. Was, what was it? it? Was correct me if I am wrong. This is from the deep in the archives. Bill the good-natured Slugorth minion. S Splugorth minion. Splugorth minion. Which, by so the way, close. is a quite horrifying creature. Uh, from, I think he's actually a character that my brother came up with. No way. 
so it's like double plagiarized. Nice. Uh, and it's a very horrifying creature from the uh, Rifts RPG that's like this big um, alien uh, uh, lizard creature that has that like takes human slaves and and flies around it has like 30 eyes that fly around it and it's it's quite terrifying it's the thing on the cover of the rifts rpg book if wow. you've seen that i had no idea of my context. my my guy was like a little he was like a little green he had like he, he, had he was two, like a little green dude with two eye stalks with little eye stalks yeah like a like a well like a slug yeah right? but with eyes I at the end i don't even i don't even remember like what I did with them. I think I just drew them. I don't remember either. I just remember the drawing, and yeah. he had like a red spacesuit, and then yeah, like a green head with a big mouth, and then the two eye stalks or whatever. And I was like, "That's cool." And then I drew a different one and like changed the name and the name of the alien race. And I was <laughs> like, "Look, it's like the it's like um uh what's the uh it's like the Marvel DC um uh what is it is it like Bullseye and Deadshot?" Is that what I'm thinking of? I mean, there are millions of. There's a uh, lot of. There, there's a it lot was of that kind of thing, right? It was like the DC, you know, checking marks. Right, 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 right. Because it's like he goes to a different school. <laughs> Nobody would ever know. <laughs> no one's gonna know. Um, I mean, the story was different, but I was like, great, green alien with eye stalks. What an awesome idea. <laughs> and also, what I was, I mean, in terms of sort of loading, ready, run relevant stuff hmm. um i was also quite uh heavy into um the video club when i was at school oh right of course so that was the we, we um filmed the uh all the you know school productions of various things hmm. um and uh that kind of stuff which was which was also sort of because you're sort of in that backstage world mm. is also sort of you know uh, getting to know some of the like audio and the lighting and that kind of stuff your dad has i mean at the time anyway uh, like a quite an extensive collection of uh um uh hobbyist uh prosumer at, at the, the time which is like mid 90s um video equipment yeah yeah my dad kind of got into the the video uh world too yeah that sort of high eight consumer prosumer Thing. We had, uh, was it a couple of VCRs um, with flying heads? Oh, which if you don't know, that means um, that means so it's two two VCRs that are um, like you get the, like two VCRs of the same model, mm. and flying heads means that um, I think it means that the heads when you pause the VCR, the heads keep moving, mm -hmm. um, which means that you can do like you know record and then pause. And then record like you can yeah do your you, you can, do your you editing edits um, and without having there be like a little like zit for every time it because right. you know when when VHS tapes you know right when you you pause listening them, to this you know all about you know dumping between yeah. VHS tapes and how annoying that was don't you when you pause them uh, the tracking tended to go wonky on it oh right? yeah God and so the, these were fancy VCRs that you could do pause and stuff so yeah there was all sorts of i mean in the in the era before uh what was called non-linear editing mm -hmm. as in computer editing uh there was linear editing which was yeah awesome. you have to record to to uh um uh vcrs and you mm -hmm. do stuff my dad actually had a thing called the the thumbs up system which was an editing box that you would set up in front of your two vcrs right and you would watch your your tapes, uh, and you could go thumbs up, and there's two buttons. You could go thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, thumbs down, and then you would hit a button, and it would rewind. It, it had uh, IR blasters on it, Ooh. so it would send the IR signals to the to the VCRs to rewind both the tapes, and then it would do all the. It, it would actually like you would it would record all it had recorded all the, t the time codes of like keep don't keep keep don't keep, and then it would record start playing one tape and hit pause like it would send the ir that's amazing for pause and stuff. yeah this is what we had to do yeah before the uh for the world so wow i made a couple little uh like music videos and stuff with that but well you definitely were uh more as a household were more embracing of technology than 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 we were over at stark manor um mm. <laughs> the uh because you had a i don't know the speed of it but you had like a modem and yeah. a, and a 
like a old Mac. We would play uh, Scorched Earth. Remember playing Scorched yep. Earth? Yep. I thought that, I think that that would have been Windows. I think that would have been Windows. Yeah, yeah. you're right. But yeah, you Bolo. had Bolo. Yeah, get your yeah your old uh, all the old Mac games. And then moving sort of forward, I remember the possibly the the greatest video game purchase uh, of you know like of of that of that era was the uh, the Lucas Arts collection mm. that had. Uh, it was like Dark Forces and Day of the Tentacle and... Uh, would have been Indiana Jones and um, the Fate of Atlantis. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and one other one that we uh, never played and, much. The, with the guy on the bike? The biker guy? What game oh, uh, Full Throttle. Full Throttle. That was, was it. great, actually. Yeah. As well. it, right, right. None of the Monkey Island ones I don't think were on there. Not on that one, I don't think. But yeah. But I um, remember playing a lot of those. Yeah, and I mean that the that era of point and click adventures. Mm -hmm. Probably, I think it's reasonable to say that that has had some influence on our comedy. Probably, I mean, Day of the Tentacle was, has a lot to answer for. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, early comedic influences like my parents, my mom especially. Uh, no, no, actually, both of my parents started showing me Monty Python pretty early uh, because. Uh, and this this might blow some minds as well. When the TV network Bravo launched, uh, they showed stuff that was not The Real Housewives. And I know that's a shock because I believe that's the entirety of their programming slate at the moment. And then the, at one point, Bravo just so like slowly transitioned to like softcore porn. <laughs> for a while, yeah. <laughs> well, we had Showcase in Canada for that as well. But the, so Bravo when it launched was like... Um, choirs and like symphony performances and then they're sort of uh you know it, it was intended to be this like high art thing but then for their like what they would have considered like slush content was stuff from england right mm -hmm. so i remember watching the avengers the like the with um patrick mcnee and diana rigg like right, the right. old old avengers series which uh is probably one of the reasons i like james bond so much um and Monty Python. And my dad was, you know, would tell me about like when there's way less things to watch, there's fewer channels, there's fewer sort of things on TV. I think he was actually doing architecture school in Scotland at the time. And, uh, you know, there's two channels at that point. So literally everyone is <laughs> watching Monty Python and then everyone comes to university the next day doing the Ministry of Silly Walks. Cause yeah, yeah everyone watched the same shows right i i love how much different variety of things to watch there are now but you get way way fewer like um like the sort of cultural zeitgeist moments where everyone is in on the same sort of thing um like you know big sort of blockbuster movie releases to an extent and I feel they, like Game of Thrones might have been the last, like, really big I mean, thing that you, everybody was watching. I don't know. Apparently, lots of people watch Succession. But. They also go, like, they go faster. Too. That's very true. You know, you get you get sort of trends mm -hmm. you know, on, you know, TikTok or YouTube or wherever. Yeah. But, yeah, Monty, uh, watching, watching early Monty Python uh, because it was like, yeah, it's... It's still it's still funny now. I've been currently rewatching the series, and yes, there are one or two things that haven't aged well, but way less than you'd think, <laughs> frankly. Although, <laughs> I mean, it is it, there. There is definitely, especially with with a lot of those old old sketch series, there is there is definitely a uh, survivorship bias. You know, you remember oh, the, yeah. the Ministry of Silly Walks, but you don't remember some of the other ones that maybe didn't hit quite so hard. It's, I find watching but, the watching the series as they originally aired is really interesting because there's a lot of really clever stuff that doesn't work just as its own sketch. Like some of the transitionary things or some of the like episode long through lines or running gags that are like, man, this is really this is really clever. And you can see how like nobody had done stuff like this at the time. So it was, yeah, it was really interesting. And of course, Monty Python is like, I don't know. I always think that like, I mean, maybe it's different now, but certainly when we were starting out, 
it's like anybody who says they aren't influenced by Monty Python mm. is lying mm -hmm. or doesn't know. Either like either you're influenced by Monty Python or you're influenced by somebody who's influenced by Monty Python. Like yeah. they 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 cast a long shadow. Yeah. It's over funny, the comedy world. I've talked about this before, I think, but like if you had to point like for me, a huge comedic influence uh that no one ever talks about is this guy Barry Took, uh, who worked at the BBC. And the reason that I say this is because um, another huge comedic influence for me early on was a BBC radio show called Round the Horn, which my mum had listened to when she was a young girl and they aired at like middle of the Sunday afternoon and she had like a little like AM whatever radio with like one headset or with one right, wired right. earbud and she'd be like sneakily trying to listen to it during Sunday dinner or whatever in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, and it was a it was a sketch you know, it was a sketch comedy radio show um, with uh, sort of like a lot of, it had like structure, like it was structured like a normal variety show, but it was, it had a lot of, uh, in a similar way to Monty Python, it had a lot of um, playing with the notion of the format. They were contemporaneous with The Goon Show. Yeah. Uh, which I think more North Americans are familiar with. Yeah, that's definitely one that I've, I've listened to. Before. Yeah. Um, but they did a lot of stuff like involving the BBC announcer, because everything was live, right? And so every show had a BBC announcer who would like step in in between shows and be like, and now this show. Mm. And so their announcer would be there and they'd give him parts <laughs> in the show. <laughs> and so like uh, they did like a parody of The Great Escape uh, or Escape from Salag 15 or whatever. Um, and there's <laughs> they, they talked about the tunnel and then this like, very like proper BBC announcer voice comes in and goes, and this week I, Douglas Smith, will be playing the tunnel. Already I'm 50 yards long and growing every day. I'm cold and dank and moisture runs down my sides. And it was just this like hearing like the guy who also introduces the news mm. <laughs> saying these baffling things, right? And just a lot of wordplay. So that, that show was written by Barry Took and Marty Feldman. Um, him of the him of the unusual appearance who uh, were played, not Igor. not Igor. 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 There we go. I was trying to say yeah. He was also in Mel Brooks's uh, silent movie. Anyway, really really funny. Uh, it's notable that when he passed away too soon, it took three people to replace him on the writing team for Round the Horn. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the show was written by Barry Took and Marty Feldman, and they had just a lot of like really clever, painful like very very silly um word play because you can you can do that on radio i mean same way as the goon show i mean, I, I love you know you've you've often talked about the you know like uh, i dried myself as i swam ashore to save time yeah or yeah. or just uh, little yeah the, the like little throwaway bits yeah quickly hide behind this pane of glass but you can see through it not if you shut your eyes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's you, the what, what was the uh describing a fight you know like he he uh, he ran at me with a curious gait, which he leapt over and hung one on me. Like, there, what do you think? Well, look better hanging on you. You've got the neck for it. You know, just like yeah, just yeah. ridiculous stuff like that. Anyway, Barry Took also worked in the television department of the BBC as a producer. And he looked at the people on... It was not the 9 o'clock... Not the 9 o'clock news. And at last the 19... And at last the something... 1928 show? I don't know. I, what, I don't know what the date was, but yeah. Anyway, he looked at the teams yeah. on these two other shows and was like, I want to combine these people into a sketch comedy troupe. Uh, and that was the Pythons. He put the he put the Pythons together. They didn't come yeah. to it organically. Like a super group. Yeah, which is you know, which is why there was sort of like uh they tended to be sort of siloed in how they wrote sketches, right? Like John Cleese and Graham Chapman did a bunch of stuff together and then uh, Terry Jones and Michael Palin did a bunch of stuff together and Eric Idle was sort of off in the corner doing Eric Idle things and then they just sort of let Terry Gilliam do whatever he wanted with the animation. But to the point that, uh, the, that show was almost called Baron Von Took's Flying Circus. Mm. And so between <laughs> Monty Python and Round the Horn listening to the tapes because the BBC would release cassette tapes of it and my mom was like, oh th you should listen to this, this is hilarious. Between that uh, turns out 
even longer shadow over over my early mm-hmm. uh, over my early comedic um, starts. Because of course, you see, this, this I find this hilarious in retrospect. Uh, my my parents were like, "Yeah, absolutely, you can watch Monty Python. You cannot watch The Simpsons. It is crude and vulgar, and you are not allowed to watch it." Right. 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 And looking back on it now, it's like. Yeah, I guess it was a little crude, but it was, they didn't, not to put my parents on blast, they didn't really give it a shot, because it's, it was very cleverly written. I mean, especially early Simpsons. Yeah. Was like, you know, often quite wholesome in in its own way. Yeah, I mean, you'd have Homer strangling his son. So yeah. it's like, I can see how uh, some parents, like, at a, at a cursory glance might be like, mm-mm. No, there's cartoons, cartoons are for children, and this is not yeah, children's yeah. cartoon. Anyway, because, I mean, what, Simpsons started in, God, 1989? I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, all that stuff kind of gets mixed together in the, the you know, influence melting yeah. pot. Mel Brooks as well. Oh, yeah, of course, all that stuff. And then all the, as you say, like, the, the early the early video games and things and uh and then yeah what were, what were we even doing with the internet in those days apart from getting kicked off whenever someone needed to get a fax i remember the the um the sound of the modem yeah i mean uh, i did a lot of like bbs i did like i like went on bbs's and played like red dragon in which was just, it was just like a text adventure game where you go like you know attack you you it was actually, different from the red dragon we play on AFK. yeah 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 it was actually a very um it had a very kind of uh it wasn't an mmo but it had sort of that feel where like you would you would have like energy or whatever and so you had like a certain amount of stuff you could do per day hmm. and so you would like you would call up a bbs which is not the internet you're actually calling another computer and connecting to it and then you get to play for this for and they have to disconnect so somebody else can call um but anyway it's yeah but then uh on the internet yeah i mean it's it's kind of hard uh, yeah it is kind of hard to imagine the internet you know what did you do on the internet before youtube or whatever i guess i guess it was mostly like text-based stuff Mm -hmm. humor and different things we sort of independently were working on our own stuff Mm -hmm. um various sort of semi-creative pursuits yeah. Um, and then um, I guess the uh, the Opie High Film Festival would be the next yeah. sort of big. So point. this is another way that video games have influenced all of this is that uh, for a time, the best selling video game series of all time, Mist, mm. uh, came out. And this thing, you know, because now, now we're on to compact disc optical drives in computers and what's the best way to show that off get your get your cd of mist by yeah. broaderbund yeah mist was a big uh a big seller of cd realm drives yeah and uh super cool game <laughs> but what uh what i think was really important for it and this is why I, this is part of the reason that i love to do behind the scenes stuff and special features and um, projects like when we did uh, the crap shoot and when we do stuff on on the disc media that we've made in the past when we go behind the scenes and stuff is because um, behind the scenes things have been hugely important to to me and making stuff over the years on the mist CD was this tiny behind the scenes featurette of like how the Miller's made this game. This is irrelevant for most people. It it was made on a hypercard stack, Mm -hmm. which was a old Macintosh system for, I mean, it was a slideshow kind of software what was the original purpose of hypercard uh it was kind of uh it was sort of a an application making software yeah most of the stuff that was sort of demoed with it was like databases and stuff yeah i was like here's how to make your a uh uh address book 
and things. But we all used like it was really big in the sort of as a when I was a kid um, for for learn, yeah, learning programming. That's how I learned. Yeah. That's how I sort of first learned programming. It had a very ridiculous programming system called HyperTalk. Right. Ridiculous in the sense that it was trying to be like a natural language system, but it those often don't really work very well for programming. So you would, you know, if you wanted a variable to equal something, you say, you know, make this equal, make X equal 12. Mm -hmm. You'd actually like type all that out. Right. <laughs> and or when this happens, do this. Like you would actually sort of try to do it in natural language and it mostly worked. It also had a graphic interface where you could be like, all right, here's a, a card because uh, it all used like this deck of cards kind of mm -hmm. and you'd be like here's a card and then I put a button here on the card and if you mouse over the button then the little hand icon turns into a clicky thing and then you tap on it and then it'll take you to a different card and so that's how they built Mist. they actually later they would release a version of HyperCard called Hyper Studio that was in color HyperCard was in black and white now wait a minute Mist was in color <laughs> yeah they <laughs> hacked HyperCard <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the lineage of HyperCard is yeah, Hyper Studio and HyperCard are more different. But anyway, yeah. it's, don't go go into it. But the programming in Mist is very simple. Yeah. But it's, it's just a bunch of you know, it's a bunch of quick time videos. Like, you know, you'd be looking at like a uh it would show you like a still image, but there'd be like a babbling brook in like the tiny bottom corner of the shot. So like that's just an absolutely minute little video. The loops right. or when you would click on something it would the entirety of the video would be just the space of the actual thing that's moving so that it can be as small as possible so the data as small as possible because it all has to fit on a cd which could only hold 700 megs 700 megs yeah 650, um 700. but one of the things they talked about in this behind the scenes featurette was how they made the graphics, how they actually rendered all these visuals that they took pictures and video of and they used an architectural drafting program called Strata 3D. Uh, and it had a whole bunch of inbuilt um, textures and, you know, you make a sphere and then, you, you know, you can like adjust the polygons on the sphere and do like rudimentary, um, uh, rudimentary modeling and everything. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. And then one day, my dad, who I mentioned, went to architecture school and, uh, you know, wasn't, did more sort of stuff in kind of like heritage restoration and stuff like that and design and things and less actual architecture. But he had Strata 3D on his computer when we finally got a computer with, uh, the first computer actually that we got was in time with cable internet. Mm. So like we were much later <laughs> to get one, but then we had this, we had a, we had a, um, Apple something. I don't know what it was. I remember it briefly at the time being, because this is what other kids at school said. And I was like, well, oh, I want to get a PC because it's better for games. And my dad's like, no, I'm getting a Mac because it's better for work, the mm. work that I do. Uh, and so it had a giant uh, ViewSonic monitor, massive CRT monitor. Like when you hit the, the degauss on this thing, it went like spung, like it was huge. And so... Which was probably like 19 inches or something. Something like that, yeah. And so it had Strata 3D. And so uh, I started messing around with making 3D stuff. And my high school introduced a film festival that year. And I was like, oh, we, I, we should do something for the film festival because I've always liked messing around. With, like, we don't, <laughs> we have looked, we can't find this, we can't find anything that we did. But Paul and I had done like goofing around with cameras mm. uh, in the early years. Um, and you know, it's like, Oh yeah, let's, let's, you know, make video, but we don't have and like, I don't have any cameras. I don't know what to do or whatever. And so I was talking to Jeremy Petter and he had an, an idea for a Star Trek parody that I don't know why, but it was a Star Trek parody, but everybody are cows. So it was called star bowl. Uh, I don't know if it was like, if that came first, if the name came first, it was like, it's like bullshit Star Trek. And so we'll call it star bowl and then we'll make everybody cows. Knowing Jer, it was more that it was like, they're cows, <laughs> was how it started. Um, but so we did this animated thing. Uh, and this would have been 
99, 98, I can't, 99, 99, I think. And uh, we did this like 15 minute animated parody of Star Trek called Star Bowl. This is, it's actually the shirt, I have, I have the shirt on. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, you can't see how bad the iron on transfer looks on the video, but it's, uh, it's very, very bad. Anyway, I think uh, even Jeremy would um, generously call it not a good <laughs> end result. But at the time, nobody, nobody at our age or just like a consumer was doing like CG 3D animation. Right. This was like a totally weird thing. And so we all, you know, we, we record, I remember getting together with, um, all the, all the voices was like, James, you had a voice in it, didn't you? Yeah. James did, Bill did, Morgan did, Kate, I think did. I'm trying to remember who did all the voices. Jared and I obviously did. I don't actually know if you had a voice in Star Bowl. I don't think no, so. I don't think so. No. Cause Paul goes to a different school, so they don't know Paul. Right. Um, yeah. And so we recorded this onto like a cassette tape deck and then the the real challenge was getting it onto a VHS tape to submit it. And the, there was like it was panic stations. It was like how the the deadlines tomorrow. How the hell do you get this to work and my we found like a guy who had like a thing where you could dump from computer to VHS and it was a whole problem and it was, we we were yeah. like my dad I think ended up paying like a couple hundred dollars to for this to work and the guy like my dad took pity on us and did that and the guy took pity on us and like worked really late to get it to work and uh it was it was like it was a huge like massive technical uh problem to get this video <laughs> to get video from a computer onto a onto a VHS on, tape onto a, something that could be played on a TV yeah um and uh yeah so we we submitted that to the film festival I mean, it was very well received in the way that it was like, everybody was like, holy crap, how did you do that? <laughs> one, I mean, one thing about CG is uh, regardless of the, you know, how uh, good a video, a, f- a film it is, mm. it's clear that a lot of effort went into it. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was hard to hear and a lot of the jokes didn't land. And even if they had landed, they probably weren't that great to begin with. But you could see that it was like, boy, someone worked really hard on this crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so bolstered by that, uh, then the next year I was like, I want to do, uh, I want to do something else. And so much earlier I started working on a different thing that was even longer, um, with, uh, a different guy, yeah. uh, at school. Hadn't, hadn't got the editing part, part figured out at that point. No, no. Uh, and also with CG, you have to do all the like. It'll be so much if you oh. edit first. Then you got to yeah. Then you then you you don't have to do so much like, work. I don't want to cut this. I've animated it right. Yeah. Um. So and this was all this was on uh like now I was doing it on my own computer, which was a uh, like one of those colorful IMAX. Mm. And the the second movie was called <laughs> it was called Gloobs. Hi. I'm Bob. I'm a gloob. Welcome to my world. The Gloobs were a race of mostly spherical, but there some of them were unusual shapes. These like strange creatures that this guy created. I gotta say, for any other failings, uh, this guy had an un just an unbounded imagination, um, and I was like, "Hey, you're an amazing writer," and legitimately in for high school level, like just baffling concepts of this scripts and everything that he would come together with. Now, what news? The Dark Ones have escaped! What? How do you know this? Because I am one. Guards, stop him! Drop your weapon or you'll be shot where you stand. Try and we'll see. Drop it or we will open fire. I keep my weapon. We will shoot. Then shoot. Kill me. Fire! What the? 
Your guards are no longer useful to you. Uh, look, maybe maybe we can discuss this and you know, get to know each other better. Your death is not negotiable. May whatever god you believe in have mercy on your soul. Uh, I was like, I, I want to do another CG video. Can you write me a script? And uh, he did. And it was... Um, now go, minion, and do not fail, or by the flames of this fiery hell, I will kill you myself. <laughs> Your warning falls not on deaf ears, my lord. <laughs> In every sense of the word epic. The Dark Ones, who are the evil gloobs, um, have escaped from their, from their planet's prison and are attempting to uh, wreak their vengeance upon the Light Ones, who are the good gloobs. It says it wants to dock here. On screen. This was one of the 38 entries in the first annual Vancouver Island Film, Video and New Media okay. Festival, put on by the Souk Film Society. Right, see you. 16-year-old student Graham Stark and his friends spent this past year turning a card game into a 3D animation. The name is uh, Gloob's Part 1, Into the Darkness, and uh, it's a... It's a a 25-minute long computer animated production that I uh, directed and my friend wrote and that I did all the uh, computer graphics for and animated over the course of the past year. I went to uh, my friend and said, uh, I really want to do something for my school's film festival. Could you please write me a script? Because he's, he's very good at writing. And so he uh, looked back through all of his creations that he's made over the years and found, uh, and found this card game called Gloobs which was extremely simple and, for some reason, very fun. And so he took the characters from the card game, which were effectively spheres with hands and feet, and extrapolated an entire story from that. And that was Gloobs. <laughs> and I was like, cool, this is impossible <laughs> let's scale it down a little bit yeah so i and i think he was annoyed uh and justifiably uh that i basically made a bunch of you know i was i was like great thank you for the script i'm gonna make a bunch of changes and cuts and edits oh it wasn't and, like uh, a collaborative editing process I, I tried to be but uh you know how you have friends the words are like my babies i can't cut any of them no you know how you have sometimes you have experiences i don't know if you've ever experienced this but you have like friends who at least you think they're your friends but then suddenly they do something and you realize that they're not your friends mm. um there was a guy who was very good friends with this guy who i thought was friends but basically was sort of worm tonguing behind this guy and being like don't trust graham he is evil <laughs> There was a lot of like high school drama stuff of like he would say one thing to me and then like flake out on it and be like, what happened? You said we were going to do this thing. And they're like, oh, so-and-so told me not to because of this made up reason that's not real. And it's like, mm. all right, sure. Anyway, so the end result is. Knock, knock. It was like 25 minutes. Mm. 25 minutes of CG in the year you know, 2000, right? Yeah. <laughs> From my iMac, mm -hmm. um, which also mercy to the, uh, the um, science teachers at Oak Bay High School, because what they had was one of those all-in-one G3 machines that had RCA ports. Right. The so that art teacher didn't even have that. So then that allowed you to, that was the way to export to video at that point. Yeah, you know how weird it is to see a computer with RCA ports on it? So I was like sitting in like the physics prep room. There was like a biology class and a physics class and then like this little room that only the teachers go in where they keep all the chemicals and then <laughs> this thing and I'd be like, could I just sit in there for hours and dub all this to tape? So we did gloobs and that was 
a mess, but even more received. You know, a lot of like the Matrix had just come out, so there was like slow motion stuff and using a lot of like popular music that was in the Matrix and you know, you know like stuff like that. But there's a couple of things in there that you know, there was like one or two shots that my dad was like, "That's a good shot. The, your framing on that's really good. You know, mm. you have a good like foreground background balance." <laughs> the rest of it over his head completely, mm. which un- again, understandable. Let blood be shed. And then so after the, again, the lukewarm reaction there, uh, I was like, God, you know who I should work with is someone whose company I enjoy and who, among whom we are very aligned comedically. <laughs> uh, and I was like, hey, do you want to work on a, you want to work on a video? Mm. Uh, and that one. I had this guy telling me that I shouldn't trust Graham, but. <laughs> no. That one became After Hours. Yeah. Uh, which was easily the best of those three. And that one actually won won one of the awards there, I think. And that was actually, at least for a brief, or at least for a certain amount of time, was actually on the Lonely Way Run website. Yeah, we sold DVDs of it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think those are still available. But anyway. I had a bunch of copyright music in it. A ton of copyright <laughs> music, yeah. Uh, uh, that was about a bunch of suits of armor waking up uh, after hours at the museum mm. and walking around and getting into a bunch of... It's before night at the museum. It was, way. by the way. Yeah. Still waiting on that royalty check. Well, the inspiration for After Hours started um, in uh, November of this year, actually. Which was about seven months ago? Eight months? <laughs> Probably that long ago. <laughs> yeah, some time ago. And for that one, um, Graham and I kind of split the actual modeling yes. and animating parts. Which too. was so helpful. Because <laughs> um, again, this was like 20 minutes and this was the most complicated thing that we'd done and it looked, uh, it had like much more involved animations. and Right, now this is where we are headed. Um, where are we now, sir? Here, Julius. Oh. I mean, the, the idea of having it be like suits of armor means like, ah, we don't have to animate mouths, you know, but like right. there was still a lot of animation going on and uh, this program was not really designed for that. No, no. We definitely reached the limits of what strata was really intended for. You know, it was fundamentally this sort of architectural program. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we had, ended up with, uh, okay. So we're going to take the next left. I will not talk to myself. 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 So, how did you die anyway? Well, I was in the placebo group. Some funny bits in it. Yeah. Some stuff that definitely doesn't land. All right. It's all right. Mm-hmm. Some stuff that was probably, like, cribbed from other things. <laughs> I think everyone likes the joke where the uh, statue of the discus thrower uh, hurls his discus at Venus de Milo, who, mm-hmm. of course, has no arms. Yeah. Hey, to Milo, catch. Yeah. Wham. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we, 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 we did that. And I guess that was probably the first, like, sort of, you know, we were working on independent things, but that was the first time sort of the collaborating and being like, hey, this was pretty fun. Yeah. I mean, by the end of it, that particular project wasn't as fun as it probably could be. No, I d- definitely some of the, like... Got kind of stressful at the end. Yeah, because, like, the again, the deadline for the film festival was coming up, and, like, the rendering... Like, sometimes the renders would just throw errors, and, like, the and your they, animation thinks, and 
and also we did we did it in the worst way where like we'd animate a shot and then render it not do like iterative file saves so like for the next shot in the same scene then we'd like destructively change where people right. were standing and how the animations worked and it meant that like some stuff was hanging over so like someone would be standing there and their shield would be like slowly drifting into a previous keyframe but also yeah. it meant that like if there was a problem and we had to go back we couldn't like we, there's no going back we had to like rebuild only I, forward i definitely recall some one of us had to rebuild animations for the last scene which by the way the joke it's called after hours quest for the grail the grail is brasso metal polish because they have suits of armor so that's the that's the final beat of that yeah Then, so you would have, you would have been, that was, because this wife. was my grade 12, so you would have graduated at that point. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I guess that was like, yeah. Yeah, I guess I would, although, or maybe it would have been like, maybe it was like sort of halfway through my last year or something, because. I don't know, because then after high school, you did a. I went up to. Like a Microsoft certificate thing or what was no it? so so yeah after after uh high school i i went up to um naimo mm. and i did a program called information technology and applied systems it, it was sounds a, it was a two-year diploma thing um which was actually it, it was very cool i don't know if it, it probably still doesn't exist malaspina is now vancouver island college or vancouver island university mm. um and but it was it was and it, it was definitely important in terms of my uh uh whatever evolution mm -hmm. in the sense that uh the first year was actually you know we would actually we actually built the computer like you you came to class with a box full of components and then the first thing you do is learn how to put a computer together mm. and then you that's the computer that you use for the rest of the year oh, that's cool um and so i learned a lot of you know just general how computers work stuff did everyone have the same computer was it like an assigned list of like hearing no, components well, there was an assigned like minimum oh, okay so yeah but people you could, had different you people could, had different stuff you could build a sick rig yeah yeah we, we you know land game stuff after hours and things sweet um that sounds and, dope actually uh and then the second year um you did it would did something called digital media technologies which mm. is um web design oh yeah right um, and so that's where I got sort of into doing web design stuff. Um, and also the other part of the court thing was between years, there was a um, practicum thing. And so where uh, you would uh, work like do, do, you know, a couple weeks of working for um, a, uh, a local mm -hmm. company just doing, you know, sort of uh, uh, intern type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so that, that was where I learned, sort of got in first into web development. And of course the interesting thing about web development is that, you know, the vast majority of what I learned during that course is no longer relevant right? because it's, you know, it's a thing that kind of moves along, but they were good. They did a good, good job of sort of teaching, you know, how to seek out because they knew that. Right. And so they're like teaching, you know, how to seek out new like resources for and keep your skills up to date. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and then I, I, and then over the summer I worked for, I did some work for the Victoria Freenet, which was a, a, a Victoria nonprofit um, uh, sort of community um, internet access place. I made like little, I made lots of the like little websites for various community programs and stuff mm. that needed them. And that that was kind of my introduction to to the internet side of the. I mean, obviously, I did stuff on the internet, but this is sort of the internet side of the sort of creative part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd already done lots of sort of video type stuff, but doing the actual um, computer development and internet stuff. I think technically, I'm still a Microsoft certified professional in <laughs> Windows 2000. <laughs> well, ah. I, although I guess that 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 certification probably expires. But right. anyway. For a while, I, I passed the, I, like, I took the test and passed the course and stuff, so. And you were, uh, I mean, you were doing, like, freelance web dev 
for several years into the beginning of Loading Ready Run. Yeah, yeah, and that that was um, that was one of the things. Yeah, that that was that was something that I I ended up doing for a very long time, and those skills have served me well in terms of um, you know other things that that, that happens more often with Loading Ready Run, like you know doing overlays and and various little widgets and stuff that we that we uh, we use for our our different productions. So again, it was like one of these things where like, you know, we met in, met in elementary school for a year. Yeah. Went our several ways. Yeah. Did after hours. Yep. Went our several went ways. Several ways. <laughs> and then we would reconnect at a job, which I'll come back to in a moment because I do want to hit on one last notable thing that happened in grade, my grade 12 was using all the skills from doing those CG things. I entered into a contest uh, that was the, it was the racism, stop it. Racism, stop it. Campaign, <laughs> that's what they called it. Uh, Are you doing a racism? Stop it. Don't. Uh, and it was this like, you know, it was a national uh, sort of- Message from the government of Canada. Focused at high schoolers um, to, to, you know, not, not be friggin' racist. Stop it. And so they it's a noble, yeah. A noble goal. And part of it was there was a video competition, and it was anyone, any high schooler, any high school across the country could enter, and then ten winners would be brought to Toronto, and they would uh, there be prizes for the school. Now our school didn't enter. I wanted to enter, but I went to the art teacher uh, who was just a quintessential, like a stereotype of an art teacher. He was great. And um, uh, I was like, hey, can I, can you just put your name on this thing that I'm in? Because it had to, you had to have a teacher advocate for it. Like, can I, can I do this? Uh, and then I was like, by the way, the prize is a video camera. Um, and, you, you know, you have all these video cameras. If if, if I win, can I have the camera? And he was like, yeah, sure, do whatever. Like, I don't, we have, we have stuff. Right. You know, you're, you did all the work on this, go for it. And it was this little CG animated thing of like. There are all of them. Well. Yeah. Hmm? Hmm. some red spheres and a green cube and you know like even though they look different they can get along or whatever it ended up winning racism stop it so they brought a bunch of folks to toronto and i got given this this camera they brought us to much music this was a huge thing at the time i got mm -hmm. to meet rick the temp um and Bradford Howe. I don't know if anyone else cares about these people. The funniest thing was they also, they would then air these on Much Music. Mine got aired almost exclusively and like way more than the others because the tape was organized. We were always listed geographically west to east. <laughs> and my high school, yes. slightly further west in town than the other Victoria High School that won... <laughs> <laughs> who were also annoyed that because the camera went to their art program, but I got to keep mine. Uh, and then that was the camera that we used for the first several years of Loading Ready Run. Yeah. After high school, I went to the University of Victoria to do um, like visual art uh, into a specifically it was a video, video focused visual art with a minor in film studies. Um, and some of that crosses over with the early years of Loading Ready Run. So we can talk about that next episode. But as a job, uh, I started working with a museum exhibit design firm um, because it's people that my my parents used to work at the museum, the Royal British Columbia Museum here in town. Uh, and this design firm was all, people who were also former of the museum. And uh, I ended up getting a job there, which was really cool and doing like 3d CG stuff for like their mock-ups and dioramas and things like that. And, uh, I can't remember exactly how it came up, but I think they were like, you know, needed like 
IT computer support or whatever, or maybe it was with websites. I can't remember why, but I was like, I know this guy. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't know what how you started there exactly. Yeah, I think I think it was that it was like somebody they needed. I mean, I think it was originally like they needed more of you. Yeah, they needed somebody else to do more because you were doing lots of. Um, yeah, the sort of the the 3D stuff, but then also like uh, Illustrator outlines. And yeah, stuff. general computer. Uh, and so stuff. yeah, they need and so they and yeah and so you know, so students they don't have to pay as much. I, I yeah I I interviewed for the thing um, and started working for them um, and yeah I did uh, I did I was sort of they like they had a guy who was sort of their IT person but mm -hmm. he was also a designer. Yeah. Um. So it made more sense to have somebody else do that so i started being their it person but you know that wasn't a full-time job being their it person so i was also a, a sort of general again sort of general whatever was needed yeah and you'd end up working there for longer than i did um right, when i went to university right because at that point i was like i just i had this this two-year course mm -hmm. um and so i was done that course and so we started working there over the summer and then you, after the summer, you went back to university yeah. and I just kept working there. But while we were both there in that summer, uh, which I guess would have been the summer of 2003, uh, we were thinking about, you know, what, what kind of fun stuff should we do? And the, the genesis of Loading Ready Run is that we were, we wanted to go backpacking in Europe. Yeah. Have not done that still. Uh, in fact, I'm only later this year visiting mainland Europe for the first time because of Magicon Barcelona. We had this idea. We're like, you know what we should do? We should take the the camera, this mini DV, uh, you know, 480p camera with only onboard microphone. You can hear it in the early Loading Ready Run videos. You can hear the motor of the DV tape going because there's only an internal mic. That's a typo. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, basically what we wanted to do was a travel vlog. Right. That didn't exist yet as a thing. <laughs> a travel vlog was not a thing that was real. We independently thought of it. We didn't do it, but we thought of it. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the notion was, um, before we just start throwing these videos on the internet, who's going to watch it, we should build an audience first. And get, yeah, and, and improve our skills. Yeah at video making and then also we're like well what do we what do we like to do we, we like all this comedy we get together and watch funny stuff all the time let's do sketch comedy mm -hmm. you know let's set ourselves this goal uh that we'll try to do a video a week uh and if you know if we can't do that then that's fine we can pull back to like one every two weeks or whatever but let's start and try and do a video a week and, you know, spoilers for future episodes. We would do that successfully without missing a week for 11 years. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty cool. But this, obviously, we're nearing the end of this particular episode, which has gone gone on for some time. But what a, what a bizarre thing. Because I distinctly remember in 2003 at the time, before, well before YouTube, months before YouTube anyway, how do you, where do you put video. I remember reading articles on, I guess, Boing Boing. I remember reading articles on the internet of like, <laughs> with like headlines, like video on the internet, question mark, right? The notion mm. that, you know, this was like, people could see it coming, but it was just sort of like, how's that going to work? <laughs> and like video was like around, like you could do video on the internet, but it was kind of like that you know, the, the, uh, uh, missed thing, right? Yeah. It'd be like a little sort of postage stamp thing. Um, like I remember going and like watching, watching like music videos on the much music website and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Like, so there were videos around, but they weren't, yeah, it was, it was hard to do. Um, and it was complicated. And the big thing was, you know, the bandwidth. <laughs> yeah. Was, um, prohibitive mm -hmm. if you got in the least bit successful you just got hammered and you couldn't like maintain it yeah 
it was just it's it's amazing when you look now at how video focused everything is and you know ignoring even facebook's horrible pivot to video uh nonsense that they caused but even without that it's just the internet is so very video focused and the idea that you know 20 years ago it was like is this possible <laughs> it was just kind of interesting so yeah we decided we were going to launch this thing we were going to call it penrose tiles um because that was a reference from a bob the angry flower cartoon that we thought was funny yeah and uh and it was the you know penrose tiles are a very neat uh design they're a geometric shape that can tessellate infinitely without a pattern repeat yeah but it also turns out that uh, looking at a, like a field of Penrose tiles is actually kind of disturbing yeah. or it kind of buzzes to like, it makes your, it, it's weird to look at with your eyes. This was the website design was, it was going to yeah. look like a bunch of tessellated Penrose tiles. Also, uh, apparently Roger Penrose, is that his name? Yeah. Roger Penrose is a bit, uh, litigious, fairly aggressively defends his trademark on the concept of Penrose tiles. So it's just as well that we didn't go with that. Yeah. So instead uh, years prior, I sort of skipped this part of my like personal development in their backstory here, but my uncle had given me a Commodore 64 and a bunch of uh, floppy disks with like old games on it, you know, cool stuff like Spy Hunter and so many Civil War. Like this is like pure, we're, we live in Canada, right? This is pure like quintessential uncle nonsense that there was like a bunch of Civil War reenactment games and like Battle for Antwerp and, you know, stuff like that. Like a lot of like war sims and train simulators and stuff like that. But also games that I enjoyed, like Pitfall, which was the first time I ever raged at a video game so bad that my dad was like, if it makes you this angry, why don't you just stop playing? And I'm like, you don't understand. Don't understand. Um, came into work one morning. I remember coming into work at this design firm and I was like, oh, I have an idea. Let's call it Loading Ready Run. Like, because you type on the Commodore, you type L O, you know, you loading. You type in the load thing, and then it goes loading, and while it's loading, and then when it's ready, it says ready, and then you type R U N and hit enter, and then your your program starts, and it doesn't trip off the tongue. I admit, right? Loading like, ready run. Yeah. could I do it over again? Maybe something with like two syllables that sounds a little quippy or whatever. But you know what? I love it now. Yeah. Um, Got, yeah, and it took a while, like, you know, also, also lots of lots of ready, start, go. Mm -hmm. ready, ready, steady, steady run. Go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then and LRL, yeah. loading, loading, letty, LLR. or L LLR, yeah. yeah. But I, did, I, I, I got the logo, and I'm happy with that. And that was, it's, it's, it's very literal, right? It's like the three dots are like you're waiting. It's like loading, right? It's like right. like the ellipsis. And then the big light for it's ready and then the the play triangle for run that's the logo and we played around early early on of like there's like lrr that was all sort of pixelated. pixely yeah. yeah but we tried like different things we tried refreshing it over the years and it's like no this 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 works and i remember uh years ago um our merch coordinator at pmc was like you know, we do white label storefronts for a lot of different companies and no one's shirt of their own, of just their own logo sells anywhere as near as well as yours <laughs> does. It's like statistic, like per capita, right? Mm. Like obviously, cause I think they, at the time or whatever, they did suffer like bungee, right? And it's like, obviously there's a, you know, there's levels of scale there, right? But like per capita, our, the shirt of just our logo sells, or sells very well, which is, it's it, that I that means a lot. So I feel yeah. I feel like maybe the, like the the letting uh, or or the the, the kerning between the dots mm -hmm. and the size of the relative sizes of the dots has changed slightly over the years. Yeah, and the arrow is now vertically symmetrical, which <laughs> wasn't for a while. But anyway, yeah. So then in summer and uh, fall of two thousand three, we started filming a bunch of stuff so that we had things to launch with. Even back then, we were like, we should have a backlog. Uh, many times we sure effing didn't, but then we did. Yeah. One Brief, glorious time we yeah, had a backlog. Yeah, briefly we had a backlog. And then in uh, October 2003, we flipped the switch. And 20 years later, here we are. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we'll talk about that in the next Yada, episode. yada, yada, 20 years later. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but yeah, 
There you go. There's so there's the backstory of <laughs> Paul and I, and what brought us to this point. And then uh, next episode, we'll talk about the first couple years of Loading Ready Run. And then later in that episode, we'll be joined by James and Kathleen to talk about their sort of early days in Loading Ready Run as well. So, yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody, to uh, the return, the brief return of the Lurcast uh, for the 20-year anniversary special. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting. So, yeah. Um. I guess I guess it still behooves us to say that everything we do here at Loading Ready Run is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. This this probably more so than a lot of other than than other things. <laughs> yeah. Is definitely brought to you by the Patreon. Yeah. Uh, or uh, you could become a YouTube member here on the channel also as an option. There's uh you know, we like to diversify the ways that we can accept your kind uh, monetary support in case I don't know. The CEO of Patreon does something profoundly stupid, and we <laughs> lose that <laughs> lose that chunk of the pie. So uh, that's why we like to like to keep the. We'll talk more about money issues uh, in uh, probably three or four episodes. Tune in for that one. But uh, for now, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. A message from the government of Canada.